morning, I'm Rose Lee, and today we will feature resources to eliminate an adolescent life-threatening disease with the use of a vaccine, and how neural stimulation can treat chronic pain and reduce the use of opiates, and the essential element of a support system for those diagnosed with cancer when we return. The Centers for Disease Control reminds parents one half of U.S. teens have not received recommended dosage of vaccines that can potentially leave many adolescents without the protection they need from meningococcal meningitis. Anyone at any age can contract meningococcal meningitis, but teens and young adults between the ages of 16 to 23 years old are at increased risk of this infection. Joining us this morning to discuss current vaccination statistics is Dr. Todd Woolen, pediatrician and CEO of Kids Plus Pediatrics, along with Blake Schuhart. Blake contracted meningococcal meningitis as a senior in high school. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Doctor, explain what is meningococcal meningitis and why is it life-threatening? Sure, meningococcal meningitis is a bacterial infection that uh, the people that are greatest risk are teens and young adults. Uh, this disease can go from very mild symptoms all the way to life-threatening or also to death within hours. It can affect the brain, uh, the bloodstream, and organs, and uh, affect kidneys, which Blake will have a story to tell as well. How does a person contract this disease? You say it's more prevalent in the adolescent years. Why? So this uh, bacteria is transmitted through secretion, saliva, coughing, sharing of drinks, kissing. Uh, the groups that are most affected through lifestyle and behavior are typically teens and young adults, also close quarter living, so in college dormitories. Um, and that's why it's critical to get the first dose for sure at 11 and 12 years of age. But as you pointed out early on, less than half of children are receiving that second dose at age 16, which is why the National Meningitis Association has launched this campaign called the 16 Vaccine Campaign, really highlighting the importance to get that second dose to give you that critical protection from 16 up into your early 20s. Why do you think parents are not being compliant for that second dosage? Yeah, there could be a variety of reasons. The 11 to 12 year age dose is oftentimes sandwiched in with school forms and other vaccines like the tetanus, the TDAP, and the HPV vaccine. But the 16 year old uh, dose really has uh, an important factor in that there are other vaccines that you can also receive at that visit. But it is critical to get that meningococcal protection using the men ACYW vaccine at that 16 year age frame. So Blake, share your experience with us. When you were admitted to the emergency room, how did they diagnose your condition? So uh, initially I was diagnosed with a uh, case of the flu and over a few hours uh, things kind of went south. I developed purple spots on my body, a stiff neck, high fever, and it was determined that I had contracted bacterial meningitis. Uh, and from that, my kidneys shut down. Um, I almost lost both legs, hands, and my ears, which fortunately for me, I only lost a few tips of my toes on my left foot. Uh, there was a vaccine at the time that I could have received, but I did not know about it, nor did my family know about it. Um, so we really are pushing uh, this new vaccine with the 16vaccine.org campaign, uh, trying to get these adolescents uh, vaccinated against this disease. So doctor, once a patient is at the emergency room and being diagnosed with this rare disease, can this vaccine save their lives? Yeah, so uh, Rosalie, that's a great point that the vaccine is absolutely needed before the disease. So while we say rare, it's also lethal. And it's one of the few diseases I can tell you in having patients that have had it and also lost patients that have had this disease. It, it is quite rapid once, it's, uh, once the patient's infected and it's spreading. Um, so the vaccine, I tell parents in my practice, I view it as a seatbelt, right? You need to put it on before the accident. It's providing that type of protection. Um, 
Um, but even with adequate treatment, once the infection has taken hold in unvaccinated patients, um, even with appropriate treatment, there is still a fatality rate of 10 to 15 percent with multiple, compl can, multiple um, uh, complications for people that live through it, just as Blake's pointed out. All right, so that we know now that this is a rare disease and that it attacks the kidneys and other organs. Explain why. Yeah, it, it basically causes uh, a complication within the, the blood stream so that you can see clotting and you can see uh, other dysfunctions which then shut down organs. And the kidneys are highly vascular and you can see a shutdown as Blake experienced which can result in death of that organ which ultimately happened here with Blake. Um, but uh, obviously as well, swelling of the lining of the brain, brain damage, um, hearing loss, multiple complications and that's why vaccination is so important and why we're highlighting the importance of this 16 vaccine campaign to get that second dose at age 16. Blake, I know many parents that are vaccine resistant because they don't know if this vaccine will affect their child and have any future repercussions. So how do you go out into the community with younger people and advocate effectively to use this vaccine? Well, I just try to point out the fact that this is something that I experienced and I was one of the lucky ones that actually did survive. Um, I had the complications that I've told you about, but a lot of people that get this, um, if, they, if they do make it, they have uh, life debilitating uh, amputations or uh, multi uh, uh, kidney function or different uh, organs that shut down that they don't recover from. Um, so I just try to use myself, um, an advocate for it, that I can point out, hey, this is what happened to me, this is what could happen to your children. Um, you know, just talk to your health care provider, um, find out more facts. Um, it doesn't hurt to ask questions, um, and if you don't get the answers that you're looking for, seek them out at this website at the16vaccine.org. Uh, there's great information. Um, you know, we're not trying to push this on anybody. We're just trying to give facts and let people see that this is what will happen because we know it will happen because it happened to me and a lot of other people. Doctor, will meningococcal meningitis vaccine, like other vaccines in the past, eliminate this rare disease as we go forward? Yeah, Rosalie, what I would say is, first off, the science is unequivocal. The vaccine is safe and effective. Uh, I would never recommend a vaccine to my patients that I won't give to my own kids. I have three kids and they all receive the vaccine as well. And yeah, with increased vaccination rates, that's exactly what we will see. And we see this with lots of diseases. And we've seen it with meningococcal disease that through use of the vaccine, and in this case, the men ACYW vaccine, you can drive this disease down. And that's exactly what we wanna do. We wanna prevent this disease from ever occurring in people. Where can we find more information? Sure, you definitely wanna to go to the website, the the16vaccine.org, and uh, it will give you all the information from the National Meningitis Association, which is really doing a wonderful job highlighting the importance of getting the vaccine at 16, thus the reason for the 16 vaccine campaign. Thank you, Dr. Wollen and Blake for creating more awareness for this important vaccine and its benchmark at 16 years old. Thank you. Absolutely, thank, thank you. you. is filled with on-the-go activities. We take kids off to school or daycare, but when we pick them up, one thing is for sure, kids will bring home germs and illnesses shared with their playmates from a play date to a trip to a nature park. Germs are everywhere, even when we're playing in our own backyard with our friends and our pets. We'll be bringing germs into our household. So how can we avoid spreading disease? The Centers for Disease Control has a healthy reminder. Michelle Hilavasa is an epidemiologist at the Centers for Disease Control with an important health reminder that will help stop spreading disease. Hand washing is one of the most important ways you can keep from getting sick and spreading germs to others. Dirty hands spread disease. This hand washing demonstration will show you how hand washing can get rid of germs and chemicals that get on our hands every day. This gel is like the germs and chemicals that we get from things we touch throughout the day, like our toys and pets. 
If we then rub our eyes, nose, or mouth, or pick up something to eat, the germs or chemicals can get into our bodies and make us sick. Studies have shown that people touch their eyes, nose, and mouth about 25 times every hour without even realizing it. To get rid of these germs and chemicals, CDC recommends you follow these easy steps every time you wash your hands. Wet, lather, scrub, rinse, and dry. We're going to show you the right way to do each step. First, wet your hands with clean running water. Turn off the tap and apply soap. Then, lather your hands by rubbing them together with the soap. Be sure to lather the backs of your hands between your fingers and under your nails. Scrub your hands for at least 20 seconds. If you don't have a clock nearby, keep scrubbing until you've sung the happy birthday song twice. Rinse your hands well under clean running water. Dry your hands using a clean towel, electric hand dryer, or air dry them. Washing your hands using the steps we just demonstrated is very important to get hands completely clean. Let's see how well we got rid of the germs and chemicals. Great, no more germs and chemicals. So listen up to Michelle on why it's so important to wash your hands. Why is this so important? Germs and chemicals from unwashed hands can get into our foods and drinks when they're being prepared or when we're eating or drinking them, which can make us sick. Also, germs and chemicals from unwashed hands can be transferred to other objects like cell phones, tabletops, or toys, and then transferred to other people's hands. That's why it's so important to wash your hands following these steps. Wet, lather, scrub, rinse, and dry so you can stay healthy and help keep those around you healthy. For more information, visit cdc.gov forward slash hand washing. Did you know over 100 million Americans suffer with chronic pain from an injury or a trauma? If you experience moderate to severe pain that persists six months or longer to recover, this condition is called complex regional pain syndrome or CRPS. Here to introduce a non-pharmacological treatment for CRPS is Dr. Corey Hunter, an interventional pain specialist at the Ainsworth Institute of Pain and assistant clinical professor at Mount Sinai, along with Doug Rod, a patient and medically retired U.S. Army paratrooper who damaged both of his knees after years of active service. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Dr. Hunter, millions of Americans suffer from chronic pain every day. So explain why chronic pain is so difficult to treat. So that's a great question. Uh, broadly speaking, chronic pain is any kind of pain that lasts for six to eight months or longer. What makes it so hard to treat is once the pain stuck around for that long, the pain may not necessarily be coming from the same place anymore. So what may have started out as something as simple as a, a sprained ankle or a broken arm, after six to eight months, the pain may not be coming from the ankle or the arm anymore. It can move and it can migrate. And because we don't really have any way to pinpoint or where the pain is coming from, we don't really know where to focus the treatment, which makes it so hard to treat. All right, so define the difference between chronic pain and complex regional pain syndrome. And what patients are at risk for complex regional pain syndrome? So complex regional pain syndrome is a type of chronic pain and it's probably the most severe that we see. Uh, we usually abbreviate it CRPS. Um, and we don't know a heck of a lot about it uh, as, insofar as like why some people get it and some people don't and what causes it to keep going. It's something that not a lot of people know about unless you're unfortunate enough to have it or you know someone that has it. Um, people who have it often call it the suicide disease because they would just rather not go on living another day than have to deal with this excruciating pain. Um, it really starts out very simply as someone just having a, a really just a basic injury or going for routine surgery and the body heals. Um, but the pain just continues and it just keeps getting worse and worse and to the point where uh, it spreads and you can't even use the affected limb or body part anymore. So how has complex regional pain syndrome been treated up until now? So 
Up until now, CRPS hasn't really had a whole lot of treatments. We have uh, basically some pain medications, uh, nerve pain medications like gabapentin and Lyrica, which aren't really that effective. Uh, we have nerve blocks, which if they work at all, uh, they don't tend to last that long. So because the pain is so excruciating in these patients, we tend to turn to opioids rather quickly just to give these patients some degree of some resemblance of relief. But because the pain is so severe in this particular group of patients, we really will they need a lot more than the average patient to develop a tolerance very quickly and then dependency tends to become an issue. Now uh, we have the uh, DRG stimulator from Abbott which is really the first of its kind because for the first time we actually have a proven effective treatment for complex regional pain syndrome and something that you know I can look my patient in the eye and tell them that I, there's a good chance I can give you your life back. Speaking of patients, Doug. Yes. First of all, Thank you for your service to our nation as an Army paratrooper. Tell us about your injuries and the chronic pain you experience. As, as you know, I, I, as a paratrooper, you, you tend to take a, a certain amount of risks, I suppose, uh, every time you, you're uh, landing on the ground. But uh, I, I had a number of injuries, subsequent surgeries, um, ended up with an early knee replacement. I was doing very well after the knee replacement and then I was involved in a motor vehicle accident where someone ran a red light and just drove their car into the side of my car where that leg was. So that led to more surgeries which um, actually put the leg back together but I was left with a nerve that just would not settle down and my leg was always swollen, sometimes very much so to, to the point where I couldn't bend it and um, I needed uh, morphine just to get through the day just to be able to function and um, that's how this began with me. Dr. Hunter explain what is DRG therapy and how does it work and is anyone with chronic pain a candidate for DRG therapy? So Abbott's DRG stimulator works to reduce pain by sending uh, small electrical impulses that you don't really feel to certain parts of the nervous system to alter the pain signals. Um, and it's the first of its kind because uh, what makes it so special is we're able to focus that relief to very specific body parts. So for someone like Doug, we can focus it on the knee, uh, the foot. Uh, let's say you maybe you had an amputation like you were mentioning and you have post amputee pain or phantom limb pain. We can use it for that. Uh, groin pain, someone may have had a hernia repair and they still have pain or pelvic pain where someone can't sit down. So it works for focal nerve pain um, and it sends these electrical signals very similar to what a cardiac pacemaker would do for to help the heart beat correctly. We use it in a very similar way uh, to basically fix those nerve signals for uh, things like this. So Doug, tell us how your CRPS was being treated up until now. Well up to this point um, we've uh, done the pharmaceutical intervention and I have been on just about every type of medication that you can imagine. Um, ultimately um, my dependence on, on just morphine just to get through the day that was everyday life. Uh, at the end of every day I just sat on the couch with bags of ice on my leg to help get that swelling down. I also had a spinal cord stimulator implanted which did help a bit in reducing the amount of morphine I needed to take but it never took it away completely. Not like the the Abbott DRG stimulator did. All right, but Doug, now you're on DRG therapy. How's it working for you? Oh my gosh, um, life changing is probably understated. Um, after 10 years of uh, taking morphine and fentanyl and all types of uh, medication, um, I have not had pain medication since the second week of February. Uh, I've had this device implanted since the uh, November of 17. Uh, I have, give you an example, my wife and I walked for three miles last night. Uh, prior to having this device, I couldn't walk 300 yards. Doctor, where can our viewers learn more about DRG therapy? So if you're suffering from chronic pain um, or you know someone suffering from complex regional pain syndrome, go to the website aboutyourpain.com. You can learn more about Abbott's DRG stimulator, uh, see what kind of conditions we're using to treat with it, and more importantly, find a physician in your area or community that's trained in it. Uh, there's a phys physician finder there. You put in your zip code and you can uh, find a physician that's an expert in DRG stimulation. Make an appointment, discuss it with the doctor, and see if this is right for you. Excellent. I'm excited to hear this great news. Thank you both for 
for joining us this morning to offer solutions to overcoming opiates use for chronic pain. And now with the use of neural stimulation therapy. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for having us. Over 1.6 million people in the U.S. are diagnosed with cancer each year. Breakaway from Cancer is a collaborative effort between Amgen and four nonprofit organizations to create awareness of important resources for prevention to survivorship available to people with cancer. Those with cancer are confronted when they get this diagnosis and they know that one person alone cannot fight cancer. You need a strong support team. Joining us this morning is award-winning journalist and cancer survivor advocate, Joan London, who continues to inspire others to protect their own health. And Kim Tiboldo, CEO of Cancer Support Community. Good morning to you ladies. Good morning. Good morning. So Joan, tell us, why is it so important to educate our viewers on how vital early detection is to cancer survivors? You know, we all live in a wonderful age now. If you hear those scary words, you have cancer, because there are amazing treatments available. Uh, but it's really important that you try to catch it as early as possible. The earlier you catch um, a, cancer die, a cancer tumor, the better able they are to treat it and give you a good prognosis and so that you can survive it. Kim, as the CEO of Cancer Support Community, tell us about your work to support social and emotional well-being for those that have been diagnosed with cancer so that they can receive the resources they all need to build a support system and find support services. Yeah, absolutely. We know that uh, when someone's diagnosed with cancer, it can be very scary and overwhelming. We want them to get great medical care and have a great medical plan uh, and a great medical team. But there's a whole other side of the coin, really the social, emotional, financial, practical issues that folks face when they're dealing with a cancer diagnosis. We've got support. We've got education. We've got counseling. We've got navigation services, financial resources. So if folks visit BreakawayFromCancer.com, they will learn about all of these resources, whether you're man facing cancer, a woman facing cancer, a child, a family member, a caregiver, or a loved one, we're here for you, and everything that we offer for patients and families is free. All right, so Kim, tell us about the important element of psychosocial care in the face of a cancer diagnosis. In 2008, the Institute of Medicine, which is part of the National Academies in Washington, D.C., issued a report called Cancer Care for the Whole Patient. And the report says that we cannot just treat the disease, we cannot just treat the tumor, we have to treat the whole person, body, mind, and soul. And if we don't do that, we're not providing comprehensive quality cancer care. So we encourage folks not only to get great medical care, but say to the doctor, look, I'm feeling depressed, I'm feeling down, I'm feeling distressed and anxious, what should I do about that? There are resources is out there. Almost everybody dealing with cancer deals with those emotions. Yeah. So you shouldn't feel like you're alone or that those are really unusual uh, emotions. We can help you find counselors, social workers, resources in your community, national resources. And a lot of those uh, you can connect to through breakawayfromcancer.com. But we want, we want to let folks know that those resources are there. We want to help you be educated and empowered in facing a cancer diagnosis. Joan, after your battle with breast cancer, as a TV journalist, you work to inspire and motivate others affected by cancer. How did that lead your advocacy to break away from cancer? Well, you know, I mean, I just had this turning point a few days after my diagnosis where I said, this is a chapter that if you are open with it and transparent and you could actually have an opportunity to help a lot of other people fighting cancer. And that's what it's become. Uh, I've been an advocate in Washington trying to change um, health policy. And by joining Breakaway from Cancer, this gave me all the tools because I hear from thousands of people week in and week out on social media that they can't get treatment, they can't get screened, they just don't know where to turn. And there are actually resources for every single one of those people. So I've kind of been the person, the connector here between everyone out there um, and the resources that are available. It's really important that people are vigilant and that they have their screenings, whether it's that colonoscopy, the mammogram, the head to toe skin check. 
be vigilant because that means you can catch it early if possible. And then don't face it alone. There are so many people there to help you. So how did this psychosocial element affect you, Joan? I don't think anybody can say that they hear those words, you have cancer, and that they aren't affected by it, that they aren't, uh, even if you have all kinds of wonderful resources. So I understood, and I remember going on TV one day and talking about how it was so wonderful that I had my husband and all my children with me at every appointment, and I heard the, on, from a woman on social media that says, I'm so glad that you have all that, but just remember there are some of us out here that don't have a husband, that we're single moms, we're working, we're trying to still get food on the table and take care of our kids while we're going through our cancer care. And I will never get that woman out of my mind, ever. And that is what just, it, it just propels me every day. So Kim, how important is it to begin the process of building a support team to guide you to credible resources available to help you care for your health as Joan alluded to. It, it's critical and, it, and it's, it's no longer just a nice to do, nice thing to do or an add on. This is now really a part of quality cancer care. Many hospitals now are offering what's called a distress screening. Again, you go in, they check your blood pressure, they check your temperature, they're asking you about your levels of distress, your levels of anxiety, so that we can help you. We can figure out what your concerns and what your barriers are and help you find the resources to navigate through that cancer diagnosis. We wanna help folks sort of with, through, uh, and beyond cancer. And as Joan said, a lot of the work's been done uh, through breakawayfromcancer.com. We've assembled these amazing organizations. I'm so proud to be uh, a part of the campaign. I've been involved since the beginning for 12 years. Uh, and the campaign really is about letting folks know that they don't have to face cancer alone, no matter who you are, no matter where you live. If you visit breakawayfromcancer.com, I can assure you, we've got some resources to help you through your cancer journey. Thank you, Joan and Kim, for joining us this morning to discuss the importance of early detection and why it's so crucial to have a strong support team in place to fight cancer and protect your health. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Rosalie. Medical science continues to eradicate some of the world's most life-threatening diseases innovative, valuable contributions are made every day by medical science to increase our life expectancy. As new vaccines and targeted therapies continue to increase our quality of life. Creating awareness to combat disease begins at an early age. Share with us your commitment to seek out innovative medical resources to address your health and emotional needs at facebook.com forward slash Rosalie Show. And follow us on Instagram at The Rosalie Show. And watch this episode and many others 24 7 at rosalieartershow.com. Thanks for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you soon.